big books, I really like them and I pretty much only buy them. I used to buy books that were like around the 200 uh, page range, but now I pretty much only buy books that are $4.99 plus, not $4.99, but 499 pages plus. At least that's what my app tells me. I have an app and it says 75% of my books are above 499 pages. So because I like big books, I wanna recommend some behemoth books, some big books, some huge books that I've read uh, that I think you would really like or would get used from. So the first book is the Oxford Handbook of Political Psychology. I actually loved this book. There is some dog fur on this, nice. Uh, I actually, I loved this book when I read it because when I went into it, I came from a position of like political philosophy. I understood that there are different ideas that people have and that a society should be governed by the merits of its ideas, and this is how politics gets resolved, so on and so forth. But the reality of the situation is much different. I, uh, I often, I think it's comparable to say that like, people will have their beliefs that they think are rational, but what really gives them their beliefs are their feelings, and they just try and justify their feelings afterwards. That is exactly what political psychology is kind of about, but it also includes some social psychology. So I remember one study in this book where they talked about just the, the actual like, features inside of a voting booth, right? Whether it's the, uh, a smiley face or a sad face or one candidate's name or another candidate's name can actually influence the behaviors of voters in, in a statistically significant way as well. And that's uh, just um, uh, voting behavior, right? In the localized setting of a booth. There's also interesting, interesting research about returns on campaign financing and whether dumping a bunch of money into marketing is a good thing to do up front or whether it's a good thing to do in the, the back end. I believe from what I read is that most of it pays off in the beginning and any money you invest towards the end of a campaign actually diminishes because a lot of people make up their minds pretty early and people don't like to change their minds, especially when they're being told to change their minds. Yeah, there's so much interesting research that goes into political psychology that it really makes like the, the, the philosophers of politics almost look like they don't know what they're talking about because the reality can be so much different from the theories that you hear. So I would highly recommend that book, especially if you're looking to get into political psychology. That is a great starting point. Now, in the spirit of Oxford handbooks, but also because this is just a coincidence and I have a lot of Oxford handbooks, and they tend to be really big, <laughs> uh, is the Oxford Handbook of Epistemology. I recommend this to people who want to get into philosophy, especially if you're new to philosophy, because uh, some people might say pick up a textbook or whatever, but this book is meant to be like an overview of epistemology. And it goes into things like theories of justification, right? How is it that beliefs are justified? And if you if you get into, like I got into philosophy because I, I basically, like the way I got in was I started going through individual philosophers, right? Oh, this David Hume guy, he's mentioned quite a lot. Immanuel Kant, people seem to talk about him quite a bit. Uh, William James, another person who gets mentioned a lot, right? I did it this way, and I remember jumping between each one of the worldviews, like, ah, no, uh, James has a better argument here. Oh, and uh, Kant's argument here, that's much better. Oh, and Spinoza's view of God, yeah, that's way stronger, and it makes a lot more rational sense to me. If I would have started by going straight to the jugular, which is that, every single one of those writers is using a theory of justification, I would have had a lot, a lot better time understanding them, but also not having this like uh, manic, <laughs> manic attack every time I read one book, I get a new worldview and like, I'm kind of like stunned by it because it like changes everything. And now I'm like, oh, well, I didn't have certainty before, but now wait, do I, do I have certainty now? Do I need to repeat this process? And I just knock my worldview down again. I would have not had to go through that struggle if I would have known that they were using theories of justification from the start. This doesn't just go over theories of justification. It goes over other topics as well. Uh, I believe it talks about, let's see, a priori knowledge, the sciences and epistemology, conceptual diversity in epistemology, internalism and externalism, uh, virtues in epistemology, mind and knowledge, uh, scientific knowledge, skepticism. There's a lot of things that this book covers, and I think those are the core things that you should know going into any topic in philosophy. So for that reason, I recommend this book. This next book, Better Angels of Our Nature by Steven Pinker, I, it, okay, so it is a behemoth of a book, and I actually loved this book. 
There's a lot of hmm, people who went out of their ways to come up with studies to debunk the claims that Pinker made. Uh, Pink, I remember <laughs> Pinker once said that he likes to make assertive claims and he hates researchers who uh, kind of make it seems to be the case kind of arguments or like uh, based on a limited amount of evidence, it seems to be why, but we need to do further research. He didn't really like that. I remember him saying that at some point. I couldn't remember where he said it, but I remember him saying it. I think that's why he makes such bold claims in his books. Uh, but so a lot of studies have come out to critique this book. Now that out of the way, the reasons why I recommend you read this book is because it will change the way like, that you view society, generally speaking, especially if you've grown up consuming a lot of news and media, right? So uh, news and media, obviously negative bias, right? They, they, what sells is bad news, not good news. Everybody knows this now. It's been like repeated ad nauseum. And he goes out of his way to prove a lot of these points that you hear wrong, right? So the mutually assured destruction theory, uh, that th this is going to be the end of humanity. Well, no, not really. People who have nukes tend to be like rational actors to begin with. And they understand that it's not rational to ever use nukes. And he goes on, for example, to prove that, or to point out that there are cases where non-nuclear countries attacked nuclear countries. And they weren't afraid of a nuclear retaliation, obviously. Uh, and I think he would add the Ukraine-Russian conflict into this that list now, if you could add like a footnote or something later on. Uh, another one might be is the per capita crime rates. This is one that I claim that he got in a lot of trouble for. Not trouble, he, a lot of people debated this, right? And he says that the per capita uh, death and crime is down um, for the last 100 years, even uh, going back even further. Uh, than that. He says, for example, wars used to have many more deaths per capita, uh, many more injuries per capita. They used to be a lot more violent. And nowadays, there's lower lower deaths, lower injuries. Um, if you do, he does make the caveat that if you do absolute statistics for like one major event, so like war, World War I, World War II, uh, or the Vietnam War, then yes, that is an exception, but if you do per capita and distribute it out, it's still on a downward trend. So you wouldn't want to say that the trend is up just because of some major events. At least that's what he's arguing, right? Yeah, you'll get a lot of your preconceptions about society challenged by reading this book, and he does it with data, so I highly recommend reading it. Now this next one is <laughs> Maps of Meaning by Jordan Peterson. I've really, like, lately got back into like listening to Jordan Peterson talk or uh, reading some of his works. And this book is actually worth reading for two reasons. And uh, I understand people have their gripes with Peterson, and a lot of his analysis does come off as like too much theory and not enough evidence. But what I like what he does is that in this book, on the one hand, he brings like myth and narrative heavily into neuroscience research, which I really, cognitive neuroscience research, which I really appreciate because it has a ability to add another level of understanding towards data that is more mechanical. It gives you like a level of meaning that you wouldn't otherwise have if you just looked straight up at the mechanical data. And he does this uh, a lot with, let's say, like the, the what system and the where system. Um, he talks about also how, how language has changed our capacity for telling uh, narrative and how that has then led to different types of ideas. Uh, also, he does a great job of including, yeah, like uh, neuroscience research into his analysis. Um, I, I, I think it's maybe comparable to this kind, of, this kind of idea where it's like A equals B equals C equals D, therefore like uh, F, right? He does that a lot with the research, which some people might not like, and it does result in like a very complex writing style, but it is quite interesting. Uh, he did this actually when he was talking about like the amygdala. He's talking about how the amygdala, it doesn't like... Um, the unknown and it tells you to pay attention to the unknown but at the same time you need to go into the unknown because pursuing the chaos or the unknown develops a certain set of competencies and skills which then mitigates the actual level of anxiety you have and he even brings up research that shows I think he cites Joseph Ledoux that the only thing that really inhibits the amygdala because all information gets sent to the amygdala before it gets sent anywhere else I believe I think all perceptual organs uh, like the number of uh, synapses between them is very low. So the amygdala processes information first. And he says that there are very few neural circuits that can actually inhibit the amygdala. And one of those things is goal-oriented behavior or focus. And whenever focus is disrupted by making a mistake, you can see the amygdala becomes active again. So 
he says, yeah, like, this goes back into his whole 12 of us for life, right? Like you have to become somebody, you have to be me pursue meaningful things. That's the only way you're going to actually become happy is if you take on responsibility. And he brings it into the like, analysis of the amygdala, the amygdala being afraid of like the unknown, right? Does a really good job of doing that. It's a bit dense, his writing style. Be prepared to like really pay attention to what you're reading. But if you want, like, <laughs> maybe like, a, if you want like a Carl Jung of neuroscience, it's maybe like a, actually an unironic good way to describe him, then read this book. Now this last book is a bit of a cheat. I'm actually not done reading it. It's Ghost Wars, The Secret History of the CIA. Uh, it is a bit of a long book. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a long book for by most people's standards. It's not as long as some of the other books I've mentioned. But I recommend this book because it does a great job of actually not just highlighting like America's policy um, in Afghanistan, but all of the webs of intelligence agencies' policies in Afghanistan. It's very easy to just to point to like the CIA and say, ah, this is their fault. This is why, like, why this happened. Like I remember he talked about this one program where they put a bunch of Stinger missiles out to fight the Russian invasion. But <laughs> once the Russians started to like uh, retreat out of Afghanistan, well, now there was a bunch of Stinger missiles that made the air uh, travel over Afghanistan very unsafe. So they ended up spending like the equivalent amount of aid, foreign aid that they sent to Afghanistan for like medicine, food, yada, yada, yada. They spent the equivalent amount on just retrieving Stinger missiles from Afghanistan, right? But he, like, he, did, they do, he does a great job of pointing out how it wasn't just the CIA that was doing this. Uh, Pakistan was involved. Russians were involved. A lot of different intelligence agencies were involved in Afghanistan. And I have yet to see a book that covers it as well as this so far. I'll uh, finish this book and I'll let you know what I think about the rest of it. But so far, I'm like, I'm really enjoying it. It's uh, quite a blast and I highly recommend it. So those are the, what are those, like four, five? Those are five big books that I would recommend you read. There's so many more out there, like The Hate by Robert Soplowski. Although I don't know if that's really a big book. Maybe it's just the font is spaced out. Uh, the Afghanistan history book I just recently read on my channel. That's another great book out there. There's so many big books to read. If you have any for me that you can recommend, I would love to see them because my like I just get a bunch of dopamine whenever I see big books. Um, let me know in the comments below and let me know if you've, if you've read these books and what you think. And with that being said, bye bye.